spent a lot of years in the computer business and then uh, about 20 years ago started a consulting company to help early stage companies come to market. So um, I think I just adapt this. So here's a, here's a few companies that we've launched over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, some of which uh, you'll recognize. We launched iRobot in 2002 with the Roomba vacuum. I was there for three and a half years, ran sales and marketing as a consultant. Um, we did Nita Robotics, which is more recent. Uh, that's a, a, ro a robotic floor cleaner that, that has a laser distance sensing like a Google car. Um, we launched Fitbit, everybody knows who Fitbit is. We launched Fitbit, we were there three and a half years, put them in 10,000 storefronts over three and a half years. Um, we work with August Lock, I think you're familiar with them. Basis Intel, we have uh, Jerry. Joey. Joey's here today from Basis Intel. Uh, iFi is a company we launched uh, probably five or six years ago. Dropcam, you're probably familiar with Dropcam, a company called Ruminate, founded by two. Gals out of Stanford, uh, a girl's toy, advancing STEM. Uh, they were bought last December by a larger company. And then currently we're working with uh, TrackR, if you know who they are. Uh, they're doing very well at this point. So that's just some examples of some of the companies uh, that we have launched uh, in the last few years. Uh, some current clients we're working on, you may or may not have heard of, VersaMe, it's a uh, research says that young, from birth to about five years old, the brain develops significantly, and the more words that that young baby in person hears, uh, the better their intellectual capabilities over time. So VersaMe has a little, just counts the words. Since it's on the baby, it just counts the words. Uh, it's kind of like Fitbit. Fitbit, you're supposed to do 10,000 steps. This, you're supposed to speak, I don't know how many words, 10,000 words, but I don't exactly know what. Uh, we're just launching that. Osmo is, uh, I don't know if you've seen Osmo, very successful. We launched uh, working with them. Tracker we talked about. We launched a watch, a smart watch called Vector Watch. Uh, smart Piano, a current client, a uh, piano you know, that hooks up to your iPad and actually teaches you how to play the piano. Uh, Casilla is a brand new company. Uh, it's a Bluetooth router. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to connect all your Bluetooth devices in your, your home together rather than having separate apps. That's the, that's the vision. Uh, Captiva is, well, Mayo, Mayo is a smart scale. Uh, and then Captiva is a, it captures the images on a whiteboard. Uh, we're just launching that as we speak. So that's just some examples of some companies. Primarily hardware, all consumer-based. So we do nothing but consumer-based uh, technology. So when I sit down with a, a potential new client, uh, here's some of the things I want to know. So here's some of the questions I ask. So any of you who are in your startups and you're, you're thinking about going to market soon or you know, within six months or whatever it is, uh, here's some of the questions I'm going to ask you when I sit down. Who are your target customers? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at how many people don't really know who their target customers are. Most of them define the market much bigger than it really is. Uh, when I say target customers, I want to know the customers who, when they hear about your product, will immediately say, "That's something I want." Uh, you know, yes, there could be a bigger market over time, but we want to know who are the people that, when you tell them about your product, say, "I have to have that product." So we want to really understand who those target customers are, and so you, as the entrepreneur in the startups, you really need to understand who you think those target customers are. The early adopters, the first people that when they hear about your product will say, I have to have that. Because by the way, once we know who the customers are, that helps us develop the channel strategy, right? So what channels of distribution do those people shop in most likely? So that'll set up what channels should we launch your product in. Uh, who are your competitors? I've had a lot of entrepreneurs say to me, we don't have a competitor uh, because they've invented something that's brand new. Well, the fact of the matter is there's always a lot of ways to do things and you always have a competitor. So you need to kind of understand what that is. And so I'll ask you about that. Uh, what problem is your, is your product solving? So is it a problem? What problem are you solving? And is it a big problem? Or is it a small problem? Or is it a corner case problem? 
Uh, I work with some entrepreneurs candidly that are solving a problem that I don't think anybody cares about. Uh, just because the technology will allow you to do it doesn't mean people want to buy it. So you need to make sure you understand that you are solving a problem and the market is big enough uh, that's interested in solving the problem. Intellectual property, where's my patent attorney? <laughs> so uh, if you're raising money, it's very, very advantageous to have some intellectual property that you think you can patent. And we got a patent attorney here, you need to talk to him, but if you have some intellectual property, you can patent it. Um, uh, investors love to have some intellectual property that's patented. Somebody like Fitbit, for example, really doesn't have intellectual property, uh, but one of their strategies was to get so much penetration and so much market share that they own the market, which in fact they've done. Uh, we'll see if they can maintain it over time, but right now that's where they are. Uh, I'll talk about technology. I'm not a technologist, but I want to understand your technology, at least first order. I want to understand it from a consumer's point of view, not from an engineer's point of view, but from a consumer's point of view. So when you talk about the technology as a consumer, you know, how can I relate to that technology? I really don't care how it works. I wouldn't know anyway. I have a BS singly in economics. What do I know about technology? Uh, so one of the other questions, a key question we ask is, what's your cost and what's your MSRP? So uh, our rule of thumb is four to one. So if you want to sell a product for $100, we'd like to see your, your landed uh, cost of goods somewhere around 25 bucks. So that gives you the margin you need and that gives the channels the margin they need. Uh, so it can, be, it can be three to one, but we'd like it to be four to one. So that just gives you some idea. So when you're looking at your, 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 your landed cost of goods at rush order, you want, you want to kind of say, all right, is that, if it's 25 bucks and I want to sell for 100, is it 50 and I want to sell for 100? So you want to, you want to understand that equation. Uh, and I, I'm sure all everybody knows who's ever done a startup or done engineering, you always, 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 always want to cost down your product. Always understand how you can cost down your product. So you have, you can make more margin or and or you can lower your price to compete if that's necessary. So cost of goods in a, in a startup is very, very important. It's probably important in almost any business. Um, which leads to the suggested MSRP. So, you know, we want to know what you think it should sell for, and then we'll look at it, and based on our experience, we'll decide whether we think that's a good price or not. Um, keep going the wrong direction. So then I have in infrastructure questions. So after I ask all those questions, I want to know are you operationally ready to go to market because we take the, com the companies to market and if you're not in if the infrastructure to support us, then we've got to get that fixed first. So you know, a lot of my clients, they, they're an engineer, they've developed a product, they have no infrastructure. So we're going to talk about what, you're, what, what have you got, you know, supply chain, contract manufacturer, 3PL, rush order, um, all those kinds of issues, finance, AR, AP, payroll, how are you going to manage that, you have somebody to do that. Uh, sales admin, we always want somebody inside the company that can work with us, that we can talk to in the company about purchase orders, inventory, et cetera, et cetera. So we need a contact person inside the company, which we call sales admin. Uh, customer care, uh, it's very important that you take care of your customers and decide how you're going to manage that. Are you going to try and do it yourself? Are you going to hire a rush order to do it? Are you going to hire another uh, out outsourced uh, company to do it, but you need to have some strategy about customer care. Very, very important. Uh, I launched Nito Robotics. Nito had, Jim knows they did Nito with us. Been major, major problems, but we, from the very beginning, I ran it, we said, we're going to take care of our customers, and in spite of all the problems we had, we still continue to get four and five stars on Amazon. Our customers were very happy in general, just because we took care of them. They had a problem, we solved the problem. So. Uh, really need to make sure you take care of your customers. Uh, and then operations management, just how are you operating the company? Do you have somebody that um, has operational experience that can just do the basic blocking and tackling over time? Company financing, a lot of your companies are Kickstarter funded, Indiegogo funded, uh, some uh, friends and family funded, uh, but at some point you're gonna do, you know, there's a pre-series A, and then at some point you're going to do a series A, probably. 
Uh, so we need, we need to understand what your financing is all about. How are you financed? Because that's going to help us also determine the channels of distribution as to how fast you can grow because it costs money to build a product. So we may want to, if your financing is minimal, we may want to go slow and build it. If on the other hand you've got plenty of financing and you want to go fast, then we can go fast. So we, we want to know about your financing. Um, and you know, just funding on the intermediate term, what's your plan there? Am I going the right way? Yep. Uh, marketing. Uh, so one of the one of the big problems we have is how are we going to build awareness and create demand for your product? Because as good as your product may be, uh, no one knows about it. Uh, and you put a nice website up, still no one knows about it. You do crowdfunding, a few people know about it, but in the greater scheme of things, not very people know about it. So how are you going to get people to know about your product? So we want to talk to you about how you're going to do that. Uh, and that, you know, that's marketing. So we, we insist that you have public relations. That's a great way to get some awareness of your product. It's not cheap. It's ten to $15,000 a month. It can be as much as 20000 a month, but it, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's just necessary. <coughs> social networking, obviously you're all smarter about social networking than I am, uh, but it's a large part of what we do today to build awareness and create demand for our products. Uh, and you need somebody in your organization or an independent third party who really gets that and monitors that and works that on a daily basis, seven days a week. It's, uh, it can be great, but it also can be uh, dangerous. Uh, paid search is something you look at. There are lots of other things we can look at, and we want to know what your budget looks like. If you've got any money to do marketing or paid search or uh, PR and so forth, so we'll want to know that. Packaging, since we're doing a lot of business with retail storefronts, we want to understand what kind of packaging you have. Uh, and uh, one of the problems I see today is people use Apple packaging, which is beautiful. They recreate Apple packaging, but you know what? You're a startup, no one knows who you are, so you need to sell on your package. So you need to have pictures of the product, you need to have a value proposition on your, on your package, you need to have a retail package. Apple doesn't even, you know, they just have the Apple symbol, that's all they need, uh, but you're not Apple. Um, so we'll look at your packaging and we'll help you uh, put you in front of the designers if, that, if you need that who have experience in packaging. We have a lot of experience in packaging, so we're going to tell you what, what you need to have on the front and the sides and so forth in your packaging. Uh, we'll want to talk about the value proposition, so one of the things you always need to have is a very crisp idea. What is your value proposition? One or two key points that anybody can read and say, oh, okay, I get what you're doing, I get your product. Uh, and sometimes that's difficult, by the way. Sometimes it takes a lot of time and a lot of wordsmithing to get to that value proposition. Company web website, very important. Uh, you know, you have complete strategy, buy buttons, videos, uh, third-party endorsements and so forth. Well, not a lot of people may go to your website to start with. We want it, so we go to the channels of distribution. Most all of our, you know, Target or Best Buy or whoever's going to want to see your website, they're going to want to look at your website. Uh, so you need a professional website, and you will do business on your own website. It just will, it, you know, probably be 5 to 10% 10 of your business uh, over time. Backwards again. <laughs> you think I could learn, huh? <laughs> uh, so let's talk about channel strategy. So we've been very successful with what we call launching and high-touch channels of distribution. Those are channels of distribution that we define as channels of distribution that can sell, demonstrate, talk about your product. So I'll give you an example here. I've, I've given you examples of high-touch. Amazon's a high-touch. We insist on Amazon. You know, you get an A-plus page, you have videos, you have endorsements, you have pictures, you have all kinds of information. People tend to hear when they know about a new product, they go to Amazon. Is Amazon carrying it? Let me find out about it. Uh, and if you're on Amazon, that kind of gives you a first order endorsement of your product that is real. Uh, in Motion, anybody know who In Motion is? In Motion has about 300 uh, airport stores. Uh, and for certain products, those are great stores because you have all the travelers, they're between planes and so forth, they're hanging around these stores and they 
have people that can talk about the products. So certain kinds of products are sold extremely well in those kinds of stores. Uh, high touch again because there's people there to wait on you and talk about the product. Brookstone, you're probably familiar with Brookstone, they also have airport stores. They also have stores and malls. Uh, they have salespeople. Uh, and people go there because they're looking for new things because that's what Brookstone kind of, their whole mantra is new. Uh, so we do a lot of business at Brookstone. Uh, we launched Fitbit at Brookstone. They still sell a lot of Fitbit. Um, so very successful on launching Fitbit at Brookstone. Uh, then there's some home shopping networks, QVC and HSN. Uh, can be very successful for certain kinds of products. Uh, look at them as free national advertising. They sell product for you. Um, you make a decent margin and you get free national advertising. And there's a tremendous secondary market. So if somebody sees it on QVC or HSN, they don't buy it there, but then they see it at Best Buy. They see it at Amazon. They see it someplace else. And they, so they go, oh, okay, they, they buy it. So we like HSN and QVC. They're hard to get on. Uh, takes some time, but if you get on there, they're very, very successful for sure. certain kinds of products. Um, and then there's also the, in today's world, there's all kinds of vertical online resellers that are specializing in different segments. So depending on, you know, what, what segment your product is in, we look at the online resellers that cater to that particular customer in that particular market. And there's obviously way too many to even talk about it. And then there's what we call medium touch channels of distribution. So that would be kind of the second tier that we would go to. And that's people like Best Buy. Best Buy Canada, you probably aren't familiar with them, but they're doing a great job. Their stores really look like Apple stores. Uh, we probably have 15 products in, in Apple, uh, Best Buy Canada. Uh, and they do a very nice job. Uh, and they have, you know, they have salespeople. It's just like Best Buy US, they have the blue shirt salespeople. They can't answer first order questions for you. So that's you know, second tier high touch, we call it. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond is now put together an electronics area in their stores, uh, and they're being successful with that. And uh, again, they have people that can, uh, you know, talk about the products. We launched a, a iRobot, our second tier was Bed Bath & Beyond, and they did very well with their product. Um, Staples and Office Depot, depending on the the product itself, like the Captiva product, which has to do with uh, capturing images on a whiteboard, perfect for staples, both their commercial division as well as their retail stores. And then we get into the, the channels of distribution that really have no ability to sell product. Uh, they just stock it. So you think about Walmart or Target or Kohl's or Costco, uh, you pretty much go in there and you have to know what the product is. You pick it up, you take it to the cash register, and you pay for it. So in, in, if somebody comes to me, a startup says, Target wants to carry my product in all 1,700 stores, I tell them don't do it. Because first of all, you got a lot of inventory you're committed. Uh, second of all, no one knows about your product. It's on a shelf. It's going to sit there for the most part. And you, for most likely, you're going to have to take it back. So uh, you know, we don't want to launch in those kind of channels of distribution. Do we want those channels of distribution over time? You bet we do. But that's after people know who you are, and when they walk in the Target store and they see your product, they go, oh, okay, that's a Fitbit, I, I know, yeah, so I'm going to buy that, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. He's, uh, he's, no. he's selecting the channel based primarily on the customer or price or type of product? It's not price. Not price. It's not price. It's, yeah. it's, it's primarily, the first thing we want to know is your Target customer. So, for example, Captiva is a whiteboard capture product. Well, you know, who's who's selling whiteboards? Or who's selling small businesses that have a lot of whiteboards? Well, Office Depot and Staples are. Best Buy, maybe, uh, you know, Walmart, no. Right, so you're gonna, we do what we call a channel map. We have all the, the categories and then we, we say, okay, here's where we wanna launch, here's the second tier, here's the third tier, and there's certain channels of distribution will never be in, you know, you may never, a Captiva will never be a Walmart customer, for example. So, um, you know, we're going to try and customize the channels of distribution based on who we think shops at that channel of distribution that's consistent with who your customers are. Which is probably one of the things that we do very, very well that a lot of people don't understand the subtlety of the channels distribution and they just say, 
you know, I want to get into Best Buy or Target or Walmart. And as I said, that's going to be a disaster and companies are going bankrupt on that. So we've taken a few companies that have started that way, pulled them back and relaunched them the right way uh, because they're, you know, they're going nowhere that way. So it's very, we work very hard on defining the channels of distribution that you need to launch in. And then we move through those channels of distribution as you build awareness and as your company grows and as the demand for your product grows. Um, so our expertise, uh, my partners and myself, uh, it, it's really all retail, it's all consumer. When I say retail, it's online, and bricks and mortar. We know there's probably no retailer in North America that we don't know and work with other than apparel. There's a few apparel. I and mean, we work with Nordstrom's, we work with Saks, we work with Bloomingdale's, we work with Target, Walmart, Costco. I mean, you can't, you know, Brook, Brookstone, whatever, whatever. So uh, we know them and we know them pretty much at the senior management level. So what happens, I just was talking to Jim earlier, we have we wanted, we have, we have three clients that we thought would be good for staples. So my partner went back there two weeks ago. He called up the general merchandise manager who we know. He said to the general merchandise manager, I want to be there Tuesday and I have, here's the three products that I have. So the general merchandise manager said, fine, I'll set up appointments for you with the appropriate merchants and buyers for those categories. So Fred, my partner, flies back. He meets for a day with the people at Staples. Uh, so we, there's probably not a channel of distribution in the North America that we can't get an appointment with uh, within, a, a, say, a 10 days. Uh, because they want to know what's new. They know we bring, in, bring out new products. Uh, they know we bring out the Fitbits. They want to know what we have. They even call us up and say, can you come see us? Uh, Best Buy Canada, we were up there two weeks ago. They just wanted to meet with us and ask what's new. What's happening? What do you see in the future? What clients are you working with now that you haven't talked to us about that's coming? You know, like I have, I do mainly business development for the company. I don't really go out and talk to the buyers anymore. I'm too old for that. Uh, but what I do is uh, work with young companies. So I have, for example, about five or six clients I'm working with right now that are really not going to launch until 2017. Uh, but we have the ability, if the client will let us, we have the ability to talk to the Best Buy merchant in Canada and say, here's what we've got coming. We're not ready yet. We don't give them a lot of detail. But we've got it coming, and if you're interested, we'll, as we get closer, we'll be back to you. Uh, so that kind of freezes them and gets them excited. And we also get feedback to our clients. So we we bet, meet with Best Buy, and Best Buy says, "Well, I don't, you know, I really don't know. I don't see that." We're going to tell our client that you know we got we got some more communication, better communication to do because they're not quite understanding what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think I've, I've kind of summarized all that. So one of the things you, you when I talk to potential clients, you look at us as your, your, out, your, your sales force. So you hire us as your uh, third party sales force. We work with you, uh, both strategically and tactically. Uh, my, my partner and I have run sales and marketing for a bunch of companies over the years, big ones. Um, we know all the channels of distribution. So you know, we work as partners. Now, the, the other way that people use try to get sales going is uh, through sales reps. And whether you hire us or not, they don't recommend sales reps, and here's why. They work in commission, so you don't have it. We work in retainer. They work in commission, so that's good for you. The bad news is they work in commission, which means it's all about getting an order. They don't care what channel. You know, they're just, I want an order, get an order, get an order. You want, you want to control your channel and you want to control your brand. With a sales rep, you're not going to get that. With us, you're going to get that because we're strategic. We're not paid on how much you sell or don't sell. You know, for example, we were on retainer with Fitbit for three and a half years. If we'd been on, on commission, we'd have made a lot of money, right? But we don't care about that. That's not, that's not our model. That's not how we do things. So if you look at Fitbit, we're a real bargain for Fitbit. I mean, we were, we were steel for that. Uh, so here's, you know, I just put a couple of pages up here of uh, mistakes that I see entrepreneurs make. I'll just go over the list quickly. Undercapitalized, uh, virtually every startup is undercapitalized. Uh, so you need to understand 
how much money you have, how easily you can raise additional money, and be realistic about what you can do with the money. Uh, the viability of the product and the target, which I talked about before, make sure that you really think there's a, a target audience for your product that really will like your product and it's big enough to support a company. Uh, this is, I probably haven't worked with a startup that hasn't been overly optimistic about their dates that they're going to launch their product. Uh, some are maybe three or four months late, some are, we have a client now that's probably almost three years late. Uh, Nita Robotics took about, I worked with them for about six years before I launched the product. Now, when I said I worked with them, I was kind of in and out, in and out. So if, if you're not ready to go to market, even though we're, we have a deal, we just set back, step back. We don't charge you until we come back and are really doing some work. So, but we're there for kind of some overall <laughs> consulting and questions that you want. We're always there to ask answer those questions. So you need to be very realistic about your dates. Also, when you work with investors, they put a lot of pressure on you, but you got to tell them the truth. I've seen more than a few CEOs get fired because they tried to finesse their investors. Investors don't like that. As much as much as they don't like bad news, you got to be you got you got to tell them if there's bad news. You got to tell them because if they find you uh, fudging, then they've lost confidence, and you're probably going to lose your job. Um, so securing a, a quality CM. So here's the guy over here who's going to help you do that. Um, you know, there's lots of quality CMs out there, and uh, I'd highly recommend that you hire somebody that has the experience because if you try and do it yourself, you can, you know, there's problems. You probably come in and save a few companies that went down the wrong path to start with. Yeah. Um, as I said before, cost of goods is very, very important to understand your cost of goods relative to the price that you want to sell it at. Uh, operational infrastructure, not understanding that you need an operational infrastructure and what all those pieces are. You know, I've had clients say, well, I'll, I'll ship it out of my office. Well, can you set up EDI with Target? Uh, no. That's why you need rush order or somebody like rush order. I'm partial to rush order. I don't know how many clients we have at Rush Order, but it's a lot of them. Um, some marketing expertise. If it's not somebody like my company, find somebody that understands how to launch products, understands how to build awareness, create demand. Um, it's, a, it's a very important piece. In companies like Procter Gamble, marketing is the center of the company. Uh, so marketing is an important piece. Uh, sales plan and team, so how are you going to do the sales, what is the sales plan? Uh, I, I talk to a lot of startups and one of the first questions I ask is what is your, what is your two or three year plan? What's your top line revenue? Uh, what's that going to look like? And a lot of them don't have a financial plan. And if you're trying to raise serious money, you've got to have a, probably a three year plan, uh, which includes the top line revenue, cost of goods, and then, you know, SGNA, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to have a pretty sophisticated uh, spreadsheet that lays that all out. Because if you don't, you'll have to do it before anybody will invest significant money. Uh, customer care, we talked about. Some people think they want to do it themselves. I don't recommend that. Uh, it can take a lot of time. Jim does a very good job. They do 24 by 7. They charge by the phone call or by the email. So it's very efficient rather than trying to hire a bunch of people. You know, when you get first get started, you don't have a lot of people calling. They're very efficient, so it's it's not a big number. If you try and hire your people, it can be a pretty big number very quickly. Some people want to. They say, "Well, I just need my website. I'll sell everything that I do on my website." Well, it, you know, the, <laughs> you're never going to get to heaven that way. The, you need to leverage the channels of distribution. Because the only way people are going to find out about your website is if you're going to push them there, which means you're going to have to spend a lot of money, paid search, et cetera, et cetera, to get them to your website. And it's much more efficient to leverage all the channels of distribution out there. Yes, you have to pay a margin, but at the end of the day, it's way more efficient. As I said earlier, launching in the wrong channels, I had a, I had a venture capitalist actually hire me because they are, they had the company they funded launched at Walmart, it was a total failure. I went in and I said, well, it's obvious why. No one even understands what the product is. Um, and so we redid that and launched it the right way. Um, 
you know, no real understanding of, you know, of North American channels of distribution. Um, and you know, I, you know, hey, I don't understand engineering, so that's fine. And a lot of engineers don't understand channels, so that's what we're here for. So that's why I hire us because that's what we know. Uh, I have some people ask me about Europe, for example. We don't do Europe, although we're part of um, an event that's held in Monte Carlo every February, and we put on a big show there and introduce new. There, all the distributors and retailers from really the EMEA tech, the EMEA geographies, Europe, Middle East, and North, and North Africa attend this in Monte Carlo, uh, and we put on a big event to, to kick it off, and we introduce we introduce Fitbit um, and a number of companies at that event, and, and what happens then we have breakout sessions, uh, and so distributors and retailers who are interested in that product come up and talk to us, and so we can line up distributors and retailers for in Europe. Uh, you have to take it from there. We don't, we don't manage them individually. Uh, in, the, in North America, we, we, we manage the accounts. So we go sell, we, we negotiate the contract, we do the onboarding, and we manage the accounts as long as we're involved in your company. So we're truly your sales force. Um, I think that's... Yeah, so that's it.